like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me now to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statues and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for these words that remind us that you are coming soon someday. Lord, even this last chapter of this last book of the Old Testament even prepares and reminds the people of Israel and reminds us now of your first coming, but also reminds us of your second coming. Your first coming, Lord, to come and die on the cross for our sins and the second coming to judge all, to separate the sheep from the goats, to send those of us who are your believers to eternal blessedness with you in heaven. Lord God, we thank you that you are a good and gracious God, that you give us all opportunities to receive your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for these words, because it is your goodness to us. It reminds us of your great love and your call on us to come to faith in you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you speak to us now through these words. Open our eyes to see us, for us to see you, O God. Open our ears to hear from you and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning we wrap up our series on the book of Malachi and next Sunday is Mother's Mother's Day. And so we'll be looking at the mother heart of God and We'll talk more about that next Sunday. Um, God has a wonderful heart. He, he shows his heart like mothers show their heart. God also shows his father heart to us, and we'll talk about that on Father's Day. Um, and then after Mother's Day is Pentecost Sunday. And I look forward to that Sunday as well, too, as we get to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And we'll be looking at that on, on Pentecost Sunday. But for now, we get to look at the last chapter of Malachi and, and see what God has to say to us through this chapter that again reminds us of God's goodness. Yes, there's some heavy things in this passage, but there's some wonderful things too of what God speaks about those who come to faith in him. I'm reminded of a day, it was a sunny, beautiful day, and I was sitting, kneeling on the floor next to my mother and she was in the lazy lazy boy chair resting her eyes. Earlier that morning, I asked my mom, how does one become a Christian? That afternoon, kneeling beside my mother, I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive my sins and asked him to come into my heart. Right after I made that confession of faith, I looked out the window. We had this picture window. And there was a cloud in the sky that looked like a picture I'd seen that someone had portrayed of what they thought Jesus looked like. And as this cloud was moving, I said, Mom, here comes Jesus. Good thing I'm asking him into my heart. 
Jesus is returning soon. Now, we don't know when soon is. People speculate all the time, and, and there's been some false teachers that have given timelines. Some will even say that, oh, we might not know the day or the hour, but we certainly can figure out the month and the year. No, we can't. But we do know that God tells us that he's returning soon when he'll become as judge to judge those who have not received his gift of salvation, but also to bring those who've repented of their sins and placed their faith in him and made him Lord of their lives, he will take them to heaven for eternity. Where there'll be no more pain or suffering. There'll no, be no more COVID-19. There'll be no more broken bones. There'll be no more mental or emotional hurt. It'll be a place of complete peace and joy. Christ is returning someday. And I'm so thankful for this passage that reminds us of that. Here in this last chapter of Malachi, it's really fitting that Malachi would write and give the words that God gave him to tell us that someday God's going to come to bring final judgment. It's something for those of you who are not believers yet to fear. And may these be words that encourage you to come to faith in Jesus Christ to know that you don't have to face the coming judgment, that you can have eternal life and have an eternity in heaven with no pain or suffering, where you get to stand before your creator with no guilt. It's a wonderful thing to know. This is actually the second time in Malachi that Malachi talks about the return of our Lord on Judgment Day. It must be pretty significant and important then, especially with it being the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament before Christ is revealed to the nation of Israel and to the world, the Messiah, the Savior of us all. There's three points we're going to look at this morning that we find in this passage about Christ's second coming, his return to earth someday again. And the first point is this. The Lord will return to destroy the wicked. The Lord will return to destroy the wicked now, yes, this might be a scary thought for those of you who are not Christians yet. I know, even at my the young age I accepted Christ, I recognized and knew because I was taught and God had spoken to me and, and told me of himself too, that if I don't repent, I will face an eternity in hell, an awful, awful place, a place that is described as torment, where there's gnashing and, and anguishing. It's a place of fear of no peace of all, eternal pain and suffering. There's no release from it. It is continuous and abides forever. Sounds severe. And there's some people in this world who say that God can't be a loving God if he's willing to allow someone to be in hell for eternity. He is loving God because he's given us that choice. And we'll talk about that choice in, in moments ahead. Listen to verse 1 of chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi is telling here that someday God's going to return. Now, he didn't realize or, or know who the Messiah was yet. Jesus hadn't come yet in Malachi's day. But he knew the prophecies that the Messiah was going to come someday. That also meant that someday God was going to bring judgment. He describes hell even as a blaze. <clears throat> there are some who have said that, well, there's no concept of hell in the Old Testament. Well, there's this term called Sheol, but it means the grave. And they're partially right. Sheol can either mean grave or it can mean hell. And what Malachi describes here is the depiction we understand in the New Testament of hell. A place that is burning and set ablaze of fire, of becoming stubble. Now, that doesn't mean that a person ceases to exist. They still exist forever in hell. They are there because of the punishment for their sin. Sin always leads to death. For as Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That death is an eternity in hell. And that's what Malachi is describing here. 
He's describing hell. He even describes it as, as evildoers becoming like stubble in the flames. Again, that doesn't mean they cease to exist. They still exist. Several years ago, we were doing some raking in our yard and, and gathered some of the branches. We we're actually doing that in our yard this past week and took some time to actually burn some of these leaves and, and some of these twigs. But I remember one year, I took some time to just stop and look at the fire. And I watched as these twigs would shrivel up. It, it, they became like stubble, as Malachi talks about, stubble in the flames. It's kind of a picture. The elements of, that, of those twigs still existed. Just like those who burn up in hell will still exist in hell. To become like stubble. An awful picture, isn't it? To face that kind of suffering. But God allows us because he gives us the free choice to come to him in faith. God wouldn't be a loving God if he didn't force you into heaven. He wants you to come to heaven. He wants you to be saved from your sins. But he has given you the choice. Do you want to be saved from your sins and face eternity in hell? Or, sorry, to, to not be saved from your sins and, in, and eternity in hell? Or to be saved from your sins and have an eternity in heaven with Jesus? The choice is yours. The wicked are sent to hell because of this reason because they are unrighteous. And there's two results, as we refer to already, for their unrighteousness. First is, their names are not written in the book of life. Last week we talked about the book of remembrance, that it may, we don't know if it is the book of life or not, but there's a book list of righteous people, and then there's a book of life that we know for sure, that speaks of those names written who have received God's gift of salvation. Those who have asked Jesus into their heart, or, into their life. They've confessed their sins and surrendered their lives to Jesus. Those are names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you have not made that confession of faith, then you're one of those ones whose name is not yet in that book. And you still have that opportunity to do so. We need to come to Jesus and confess our sins so that we can be entered into the Book of Life so we can have an eternity in heaven. Also, the second result is, is evil doers are cursed. An eternity in hell is a cursed place where because of the curse of sin, we feel the effects of that curse for eternity. I've heard some people say sometimes that, well, you know what? I'd rather go to hell because well, I know my family have passed away and that that's where they're at. So I'd rather go where they are and where our friends are. Besides, that's where all the fun people are. They have no concept of what hell is like. It is an awful place. You are not going to be aware of those who are there in hell because you are in so much tormented pain yourself that you will not even recognize those who are nearby. Hell is an awful place. It is a place, again, that God didn't design for us, but God has used because, because of our own sin and our refusal to turn to him. Hell is a real place, and it is where those who are not righteous are sent when Christ returns, because when he comes, he, again, he'll come to judge the world. His first coming was to come to provide salvation. His second is to provide a judgment. Which side of the judgment will you be? Are you one who have confessed your sins and gets to see the one, wonderful things we talk about next? Or are you going to be facing eternity in hell? The choice is yours. The second thing we find in this passage that talks about Christ's return is that the Lord will return to renew the righteous. The Lord will return to renew the righteous. Here's where we get to see the positive side of this passage, the, the goodness of God. You know, we've taught, you've probably heard me say this time and time again. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. He has died on the cross for our sins. He has paid the penalty for our sins. And he offers us now then 
freely his gift of salvation. We are renewed and restored in him in two ways. We're restored at that moment of salvation. He has placed his righteousness upon us. We call that the doctrine of, of imputation. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, because we can't become righteous on our own, he places his righteousness upon us. He makes us right with him again. And Malachi is referring to that. He's telling us that there's going to be a time when God returns and he's going to restore the righteous. He's going to restore them to fullness. Listen to verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. In verse 3. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Here is a wonderful picture. There's three pictures that Malachi gives here that the Lord gave him to give to us. Here's what happens when Christ returns. He's going to restore the righteous. And he gives this picture of, of being restored. Again, verse 2. The Son of Righteous shall rise, raise with healing in his wings. There are several times in Scripture that it gives this picture of wings of an eagle or restoration being on wings. Do you know that? We actually had a problem with this outside of our window here before the service started. There was this bird that flew and hit the window and, and fell. And, and our kids thought that, that the bird was dead at that moment. And I said, well, hold on, just wait. Let's just wait and see. Maybe he's unconscious or maybe he's just kind of stunned. So, sure, you mentioned the same thing to the kids too. And, and we waited. And after a while, the kids went back and saw, oh, the bird's moving. And we haven't checked in a while, so we don't know if the bird's flown off yet or not. But we could see that that bird was healing in that moment. The wings of birds is an example of healing that God gives us. In his wings, there's healing for us. So whether it's because of physical ailments or because of mental or emotional things, God brings us healing when he comes to restore us fully to take us home to heaven. What great words of encouragement for us, those who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that God now calls righteous. He renews us and he restores us. Renews us to be fully healed. I look forward to that day when we go to heaven and never have to face trials or tribulations or pain or suffering anymore where we can know the full peace and the full joy of the Lord. I'll give you some of the passages that, that, that there's healing in, in his wings. Uh, if you want to write these down or watch this later again and, and write these passages down, but Exodus 19, verse 4, Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, Psalms 51, verse 1, and 64, verse 4, 63, verse 7 and 8, and also Psalms 91, verse 4. They all speak of wings and, and God's wings in healing us. Now, it's figurative language, but yet it speaks of the wonderless, wonderfulness of God restoring us, restoring his righteousness in healing in him. It's also taking our burdens and carrying our burdens for us. Maybe you've been feeling anxious these days. Um, maybe some cabin fever, to, fever too because of being stuck at home and in your yard. But yet, there's healing for us. God will restore us someday. Also, it mentions here too, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Have you ever seen calves shortly after they've been born? There's such joy in them. Uh, my in-laws have a farm down south, and we go most years down to visit them and sometimes help with cattle drives. And it's really fun to watch the calves. I know my wife loves to see the calves being born. And they're, it's really funny to watch them when they're, when they're really young, how they bounce around. It, it's a sign of joy. That's the same kind of picture that God gives us, that when he comes to restore us, we're going to know that joy so much that we're being like those calves bouncing out of the stalls, all excited because of life, the life that Christ has given us. The last picture that Malachi gives us here of when God comes to renew the righteous is that we stomp on 
the unrighteous. Now, to me, this is a heavy thing right now, actually. Because for us as a true Christian, we don't want to view this as, hey, we get to stop all those who are our enemies. No. It, it's more for me of, Lord, may those people come to faith so they're not as ashes as, as we trample over them. To me, it's, it's a thing of humility that should bring us to a place of humility, realizing, hey, we're not going to be ashes because Christ has saved us. He's renewed us. But it's a wonderful thing to know that as a Christian, we're not going to be those ashes on the foots of the righteous. May we pray then, too, for those who are not yet righteous, who have not received the gift of salvation, that they come to faith in Jesus really soon. Christ is going to come for us the second time to renew the righteous. It's kind of like this picture, too. There's actually some starfish that have this really unique ability that if one of their one of the limbs of the star are cut off, it can grow back. And there's some actually that because their organs are in those in those arms of the starfish can actually grow a whole new starfish because of it. It's that kind of picture of renewal, that God can renew us and restore us to fullness. And that's what the Lord is going to do when he comes on Judgment Day. For those who are the righteous, he's going to renew us fully. So that means the Lord will heal. And we see this in Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Isn't that wonderful to know? That if you have received the gift of salvation, that you are God's child, that you get to go to heaven and Jesus will wipe away every tear. The only, t- the only tears you'll have after that will be tears of joy. Such joy and happiness because we don't have to face trials and tribulations. As we just read in Revelations 21 here, there will be no more mourning. We won't know pain. We won't know suffering. We'll only know joy and peace. Also, the Lord will restore, as we talked about already, in 1 Peter 5, verse 10, Peter writes, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Isn't that wonderful to know? That when God comes to judge again, he's going to take us home to heaven. And he's going to restore us fully. He's going to confirm us as his children. He's going to strengthen us. And he's going to establish us in heaven forever. The last part of this too is the Lord will take us home. I look forward to that day when Christ will take us home to heaven. First Thessalonians 4 verse 16 and 17 gives us that picture. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day when we hear that trumpet sound and God calls us into the sky and we get to be led home to heaven, to spend eternity with him. Well, that's the first two things that God teaches us through Malachi here about Christ's return. There's a third thing that we see in this passage, and that is in preparation, Elijah will restore father-child relationship. <clears throat> in preparation, Elijah will restore father-child relationship. In this final section, we see a prophecy about Elijah was to come again to prepare the way of the Lord. We believe that that person is John the Baptist. And we see that actually in the New Testament. When when Jesus talks about John the Baptist, he says that he was Elijah to come and prepare the way for him. In this passage, it says this again, verse 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. There's been some confusion about this passage that some have used it to mean that well, God's going to stir the hearts of us as children back to our earthly fathers and our earthly fathers back to their children. Others believe that it means that it's going to be Elijah stirring our hearts to God and God stirring his heart back to us. I'm not sure which is the right, correct interpretation of this, but both certainly fit this passage. As it talks about fathers in the plural, their hearts have been turned back to their children. So we certainly can take it that way. And for those of us who have a strange relationship with our fathers, like to hear that. And it is good news. And, and we do pray for those of us who have a strange relationship with our fathers, that our fathers' hearts will be restored back to us. And so we hope that our hearts are restored back to our fathers as well. But it could also be taken to mean that through Elijah, that God sends, who was John, John the Baptist, would stir our hearts towards God and God to our hearts, or God's heart towards us. And we see that certainly to be true in the New Testament because God's heart is stirred towards us because he sends Jesus who becomes a propitiation for our sins and dies for us. When John the Baptist came and started to preach the gospel of repentance, it started to stir the hearts of the people of Israel and, and other people too, Gentiles as well, their hearts were stirred back towards God and prepared the way for Jesus for his first coming. But also in preparation for the last days, for when Christ returns again. This is wonderful news for us. And it should bring, bring joy to us to know that God will someday restore our hearts to our fathers and our fathers to us. And his heart has been restored to us. And our heart has been restored to him as when we hear the gospel and come to faith in him. It's part of God's restoration of us, stringing our hearts back to him and his heart to us. It's kind of like this. Several years ago, there was an angry man who rushed uh, through a museum in Amsterdam <clears throat> until he reached Rembrandt's famous painting, Night Watch. He took out a knife and slashed it cut it up several times, repeatedly. short time later, an, uh, another hostile man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and began to smash Michelangelo's beautiful sculpture, the Piet, the Pieta. I don't know if I said that right or not. Both of these works were cherished works of art. And, and we would think that, well, they must have just thrown out that painting and that sculpture. But no, what they did was they hired skilled workers to restore them back. Beautiful pieces of work restored back to look beautiful again. That's kind of the picture that God wants to do with us. To restore us into the beauty that he created us to be in the first place. God was going to use Elijah, John the Baptist, to restore our hearts to the Father the Father's heart to us. That is wonderful to know that God continues to seek after us. There's a couple points to this. First, God will draw us to himself. God is continuously and always trying to draw us to himself. God gives oper ample opportunity for us to come to faith to him. I also once heard that in order for us to get away from God, we have to actually overcome hurdles that God puts in our way to draw us to himself. It actually takes more work to run away from God than it does to go to God. Look at our society. You can see the truth of that. Yet, it seems so easy, doesn't it, to walk away from God. But that is actually harder work to walk away from God than to go to God. Because God will draw us to himself. He's seeking us daily, moment by moment, trying to draw us to himself. This is a matter of us running to him. James 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God draws near to us. 
makes it easy for us to draw near to him. So may we draw to him too. It also shows that God doesn't give up on us. When people give up on us sometimes, whether it be family or friends or neighbors or or the people, sometimes people give up on us, don't they? But God never gives up on us. It's because he loves you. He created you for relationship. That's why he doesn't give up on you. Not until your dying breath. There's always hope for you to come to faith in him. Also, we will seek the Father. We need to seek the Father because it's only through God that we can find true healing, that we can find true restoration. 1 Corinthians 29, verse 9, 28, sorry, verse 9 says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your Father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. These words are, are actually echoed in the New Testament too. Seek the Lord while you might be found, because he can be found by you. You only need to pursue him. I once had a conversation with an, with an atheist who had said that, well, I sought after God and, and I couldn't find him, so I don't think he exists. Sad in my heart. Because one of two things happen. Even the person, either the person didn't truly seek the seek God, or they didn't seek God long enough. Or maybe their eyes were blinded like by the God of this age, by Satan, and couldn't see the work that God was doing around them. We can have the Holy Spirit open our eyes to see what God is doing. To see that God is real, that He loves us so much. History shows it, proves it. Creation shows it and proves it. That God exists and that he loves us all dearly. God can be found. He wants to be found by you. After all, he gives you opportunity after opportunity to see his goodness and his love for you. This is a positive message that God gives us. Yes, it's a word of warning. For those of us who have not received Christ, there's a warning for us. Jesus is coming soon. And if you don't want to face that day of judgment with fear and dread for the sin that you've committed and the, the, the consequences of that sin, know that you can turn to Christ. That you come to him and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you and I place my life in your hands. I trust you. I place my faith in you and you can be saved from your sins. Be reminded that the Lord will return to destroy the wicked, but he's also coming to renew the righteous, and he's going to return our hearts to him as his heart is stirred towards us again. Are you ready? Have you confessed your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you now living in holiness? Are you busy about the Lord's work, doing the work of evangelism and discipleship? We must know the purpose of the Lord's return, and his return is to take us home to heaven. So are you ready for his return? I want to call us the four points of action. The first one is for you if you have not yet received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that is this, get saved. All it takes is some humility and turning to Jesus and saying, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that I can't do no good works on my own to be saved. So I turn to you and ask for forgiveness of my sins. I place my life in your hands, and I place my faith in you. If you pray such a prayer like that, know that you will be saved. And you don't have to face eternity of hell anymore. You get to have an eternity in heaven with God, free of sin, and pain and suffering. For those of us who are Christians, who have received that gift of salvation, this next point of action is for us then, to live in holiness. Yes, it is possible that we as Christians will sin still. It's part of our human nature sometimes that we are still learning to shed off. But choose to live in holiness. We can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has given us power to overcome any temptation. Third point of action is be busy about the Lord's work. 
Yes, there's times where we may need to rest. God allows for that. That's why he created the seventh day, a day of rest. Otherwise, be busy about the work God has called us to do. Reaching the lost with the gospel, encouraging the brothers and sisters in Christ in discipleship. And all together, worshiping our Lord God together. And the fourth point of action is this. Watch for his return. That doesn't mean we need to be all crazy about prophetics, the prophecies of the future yet, of Christ's return. No, look for the signs. But as we see the signs fulfilled, rejoice because it is a sign that Jesus is returning soon. Take us home. There's a warning for us, as you have heard already through this morning's sermon, that if you do not heed these words, you will gain... If you do not heed these words, you will miss the opportunity to receive Christ's salvation. And you'll miss his multiple blessings, including the blessing of heaven. But the pause aside, if you do heed these words, you will gain salvation and many, many blessings, both in this life and in eternity in heaven. So be busy about his work and loving him. Do you want to know freedom from sin? Do you want to know the peace that when Jesus returns that you will not have to face judgment? Then receive his acceptance and his comfort. Come to faith in him and live your life for him. Return to him as he will return to you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your grace, that you are an awesome and mighty God. The Lord God that you would choose 2,000 years ago to come to send the Son to die on the cross for our sins and to give us this message in Malachi and, and in throughout your whole, your whole scriptures. Lord, your whole Bible is the story of redemption, a story of calling us and creating us and giving us the choice to come to you to be renewed. Lord God, we thank you so much that you have done the work of restoration for us already. It's complete. We only need to receive it. Thank you, Lord God, for that work you've done for us. Lord God, we pray for the person who is listening to this and watching this, who does not yet know you, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would come to faith and know you, to know the peace that you offer the restoration that you offer to us. Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, we pray that we as your children will be faithful to you, to daily give thanks to you because the wonders you've performed for us, how you've died for us and loved us. God, truly you are a great, gracious and awesome and loving God. Lord God, we thank you that you have come to restore us. We look for that day, Lord, when we will be fully restored in you. Lord, we do pray in this time, though, still, that while we face hardships and trials, while we face tribulations, Lord, that you'd still heal us in this life. But, Lord, we look forward to that day of renewal when we don't have to face any of those trials or pains and sufferings again. God, truly, you are a good God. You are a loving God. You are a gracious God, and you are a just God. You have fulfilled justice at the cross. We thank you, Lord God. Amen.